We're going to go ahead and get started so we stay on time. Okay. Okay. So I know there's many people around the state of Ohio that have contributed to the development of the Ohio Open Ed Collaborative. And I know many of you are sitting in the audience, and I want to thank you for coming and being here. But I have the pleasure to introduce to you four important people who have played key roles in the development of the Ohio Open Ed Collaborative OER projects and affordability initiatives on their own campuses. Sitting immediately to my right is Anna Bindo, and she's the Director of Affordable Learning Initiatives at OhioLINK, where she manages efforts to lower the cost of college for Ohio higher education students by assisting our member libraries and campuses in identifying strategies for open and affordable learning textbook and course material adoption and helping locate statewide shareable library materials as well as open educational resources that are no cost or lower cost to students. Second from my right is Dr. Anna Davis. She's an associate professor of mathematics at Ohio Dominican University, and she represents ODU on the Ohio Open Ed Collaborative Steering Committee. She is the team lead for three upper level mathematics courses and is serving as a project manager for two additional teams. Third from my right is Ashley Miller. She's the associate director of affordability and access at the Ohio State University. She leads the Affordable Learning Exchange at OSU and helps faculty who wish to move away from conventional textbooks to low costs and open educational resources. The Affordable Learning Exchange supports the Ohio Department of Ed, OER, and Innovation Grant recipients, as well as OSU faculty who are recipients of an internal OSU grant to make learning materials affordable. Fourth from my right is Amanda Postal. And she is the Ohio Department of Higher Education Grant Project Co Coordinator at OSU, responsible for organizing the boot camps for the teams who participated in the cohorts of the ODHE grant projects. She also collects the progress reports for the projects. Okay, so our first question is, can you tell us about how the Ohio Open Ed Collaboratives got started? the organization and goals behind the grant initiative. Okay, I'm going to take that one. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm just very briefly going to give some background. So um, the Ohio State University, Ohio, um, I'm sorry, um, Ohio Dominican and um, North, Cent no, that's the one I was missing, North Central State <laughs> College. Uh, we all apl applied for the same innovation grant, and we were all awarded um, the grant, but asked to um, come together uh, and kind of uh, reassess and, and repropose a new collaborative proposal. So uh, that's what we did, and uh, we came up with our, our deliverable is uh, to transform um, the, the course materials for 19 of our shared highest enrollment courses, um, plus three upper level math courses at Ohio Dominican, uh, with open content, and to reduce the um, spend for students in those courses at campuses across the state by 70%, and to uh, quadruple the um, the um, amount that we were awarded in savings over the course of three years through adoptions of those materials. Um, so everyone here is on the steering committee and was part of the um, initial, we, we were the ones who put together those initial proposals and then came up with the um, kind of uh, new plan as we were awarded. Uh, the, the exception is, is Anna Bindo who is from Ohio Link and Ohio Link is a um, didn't, didn't actually initially put together one of the proposals, but has been a really um, huge partner and support for the rest of us. Um, so that's in a very like high level what the project is. Okay, so our slides accidentally went backwards. There we go. Um, 
So this, uh, this is actually my slide that um, was kind of part of this answer. This just sort of gives a very, um, very high level timeline of the work that we've done so far. And so um, we, we are in our third cohort now and we're going to be, um, everything's gonna be available at the end of this calendar year. So we've been working on this um, for a little while now. Can you tell us about the topics covered during the phases of development and where you are at now? Are participants creating open textbooks or open courses? Okay, I'm gonna address this one. So uh, as Ashley mentioned, there were three different grants that came together um, and one of them, uh, the one that North Central State put forward, they put forward with the Ohio Association of Community Colleges and it's North Central State College with 14 other community colleges as well. So there's 15 institutions there, plus Ohio State, plus Ohio Dominican. So all of these groups together uh, were tasked with um, create or finding open content and mapping it to 22 courses. So the question then became which courses are we going to tackle? And there were lots of different considerations as to which ones to do. The uh, community college grant really wanted to focus on high enrollment courses. And so we did that for a large percentage of the courses. Um, so we really wanted to tackle courses that had high enrollment at both the community college level and at the four year level. So that is a lot of the general ed, general curriculum courses. Those are also, um, oh, let me make sure I have the um, terminology here right, transfer assurance guide, TAG, or the Ohio transfer module courses. So we wanted to make sure that we were using courses that would be able to transfer seamlessly between lots of different campuses in Ohio. So that was a major priority. We also focused on courses that had high college credit plus enrollment. Um, so that was something that because there are also high school students that would be involved with the, in those. It just increases the amount of savings throughout the state to a larger pool of people, especially community colleges that have a really high college credit plus enrollment that we figured that, is it not loud enough? That that would be a big bonus for them as well in um, being able to help their students who are also still at the secondary level. So that was another um, focus or a priority for us. And then Anna's um, grant from Ohio Dominican was focused on three higher level math courses. And so since we were kind of rescoping and collaborating, we wanted to make sure that her focus on her grant was included as well. So there's three higher level Ohio Dominican courses in there as well. So you have the list up here. Another advantage of doing some of these um, high enrollment general ed courses is there's a lot of open material out there already. And so it's not um, as difficult to find material and we didn't have to go to teams and say, you need to write a textbook for this because obviously in the timeline that we have, as someone mentioned earlier, that it can take four years to write a textbook, that wasn't going to work for us. So we needed to be able to find something um, that the teams could actually accomplish in that time period. So these are the courses that we worked on. And the question as to whether we were asking them to do open textbooks or open courses goes back to that timeline thing again. We could not ask people to write textbooks uh, in the amount of time that we had provided. So what we were asking them to do is to map open content to our transfer assurance guidelines or our course objectives. And so we asked them to create course content packages. That's kind of what we called them. And um, if there were any gaps or if there were areas that were not represented by open content, those were areas that they could fill in and contribute. And Ashley's going to talk more about that in a little bit. But not open textbooks. We weren't asking them to do open textbooks. They, they were open course content packages. Okay. Um, Ashley, can you give us more details about what teams are being asked to produce? Yes, um, so I have put together a little slide up here that has, uh, one, on one half it has the, uh, a snapshot of the scope of work document, and on the other half it has um, a, a screenshot of the Ohio Open Ed Collaborative um, site where the content lives for the courses. Um, so Anna mentioned that we, um, we added some complexity to this by, by not focusing on open textbooks. And we did that because uh, we rarely, um, even with an individual faculty adopter, 
um, find that there's a open textbook that, that does everything that someone needs it to do. So it typically is a course redesign project and opening it up, opening up the scope beyond just an open textbook is really important um, because that's where uh, you're able to um, find content that really uh, speaks to your learning objectives without being constrained to a textbook because that's the, that's one of the pedagogical uh, reasons for participating in open education is that uh, you, you can have the freedom to sort of write it yourself and not um, teach based on what's prescribed in a textbook. So um, the, the first thing that we did was we asked uh, folks to um, do this course mapping by learning objective to um, open resources that they would find in a variety of, through a variety of sources. Um, that did leave gaps and so we asked them with some guidance to tell us where the gaps were and what they might produce to close those gaps. And so that's where the scope of work document comes in. We're project managers at, o at OSU. That's, that was our kind of our biggest role in this project. Um, so we uh, kind of helped everybody <clears throat> figure out how to articulate their needs um, with, with this vernacular. So they created a scope of work document that um, said, okay, this is what we found and what we liked. These were the gaps. These are some things that we think that we might be able to produce um, to fill those gaps. <clears throat> Excuse me. So this, those could be uh, maybe the equivalent of a chapter length narrative document. Um, but it could be something like a test bank or other ancillary materials, um, slides and instructor um, assets that could help someone adopt this content. It could be uh, things that support students um, like um, assignments or just other resources that could be available for students. So kind of focused on ancillary materials and then also content gaps where they exist. So they, they complete a scope of work document, the steering committee looks at it, we, we say, sure, that sounds great. Um, and then the end result, and oh yeah, I have slides for this too. Whoops. Artifacts they create. Um, after they, they map the content, um, they, I actually just said this, so they could put together some special projects. Sorry, I keep looking up, it's awkward, but. Um, I don't really know where to point, maybe there? Yep. Okay, uh, and then this is what it looks like when it's all put together on the site um, where, where uh, faculty go to adopt the content. So uh, it's organized by, um, you know, lesson and, and topic and uh, it, 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 it's a complete course. So the, uh, the gaps that were filled with special projects kind of disappear um, and just becomes um, organized for the end user as um, just a course might be organized. And I think that's it for me. This is just one more screenshot that drills down um, past that first page that you encounter when you go find the course. And this is just showing a little bit about what the um, content, how the content is organized in this particular course. Okay, thank you. Um, Amanda, how were teams selected and was there an application and how were team roles identified? So we did have um, an application process. So they were asked to, is everyone able to hear me? I can't tell. Um, they were asked to complete an application, a brief application, attach their CV um, for most of the roles, for the team lead role and for the um, content contributor role, we also asked for a letter of support um, from their department chair or whoever their direct supervisor would be, just so they know the work that was involved with the project. Um, and then as a steering committee, we all sat down together and kind of divided up going through the applications for each of the teams. So we divided them up by topic area and went through and just kind of made our decisions based on that. We also wanted a nice mix on the teams of two-year, four-year, public, private, um, just to have a nice representation from universities and um, institutions across the state of Ohio. So that was a pretty important piece of the, the puzzle too. And as 
um, since Ashley and I work at Ohio State, we did a lot of our own kind of internal recruitment, talking to faculty that we knew who were already engaged with OER to try to get more participation from them in this project, as I'm sure that Anna did also at Ohio Dominican. Um, you could see on that one slide that our cohort too was much smaller. Um, we didn't have as many applicants for those courses at that time, so we just kind of had to roll with the punches and be flexible um, and figure out what we were going to do. So this third cohort is a much larger cohort, uh, thus the reason why Anna Davis as well as Mike Welker um, from North Central are assisting with the project management this time. Um, so the team roles were identified based on those applications as well. So if folks were interested in being a team lead, they would indicate that on their application and then also let us know what skills they felt they had that would help with that. Have you served you know, as a lead on committees at your institution? Um, you know, are you in charge of your department? Different things like that. Um, whereas most of the folks were probably applying more for that content contributor role. And we also have reviewers on the teams, um, two to three per team depending on the size, as well as a subject matter librarian. Um, I know a couple of those folks are, are in the room today. So they are very much um, an important part of the team as well, helping them find that open and available content, um, as well as that partnership that we have with OhioLINK that provides us with a lot of those resources. Um, as far as the kind of what the different roles do, the team leads are kind of like my boots on the ground project managers. They're the subject matter experts. So I rely on them a lot to kind of help me with that piece of the work. I'm um, just knowing, you know, does this fit? Does this fit within the scope of the project? Is this a good resource? Um, whereas I'm kind of looking over the project as a whole. The content contributors are there um, and the team lead also serves as a content contributor. So they're mapping that content based on that list of topics and sections that the team puts together. And then our librarians are kind of assisting throughout the whole process, helping them find their open content. Uh, the reviewers come in a little bit closer to the end to kind of give a second set of eyes. This isn't a blind review process, which was kind of important to us as well. The reviewers kind of became like an extension of the team. So they interacted on team meetings, um, had you know conversations with those who they were reviewing their content, and it was really a nice like open conversation uh, with those folks. So I think that so far that uh, model has worked really well for the work that we've been doing. And Anna's going to talk a little bit more about how that team dynamic kind of works um, for her teams that she managed. Okay. Thank you. Um, is there anything else Amanda would like to say about the work involved in managing the teams? <laughs> like from your end of it? or um, it's. It's a lot different than any other project that I've ever been a part of. I think mostly because it's not just people at Ohio State. So the projects I've managed previously, it's all faculty who are like, I could walk across the street to their office or hop on a bus. This is folks from all over the state. So all of our meetings are virtual. The boot camp is really the only time most of them actually physically meet in person, unless they happen to know each other or work at the same university. Um, it's a lot of coordination, I've become even more organized, I think, probably than I was before this job. Um, color coding calendars and kind of keeping the teams straight. Um, lots of use of Google Drive and keeping everything organized and I think just keep sticking to the timelines um, and communication, communication, communication has been the biggest, um, the biggest piece of it for sure. Thank you. Um, Dr. Anna Davis, could you tell us about the factors that went into completing this project? In particular, could you tell us about the existing materials you found working with a librarian consultant, working with reviewers, and working with your team? And what did you ultimately create? All right. Okay, so linear algebra was uh, one of the three um, courses that Ohio Dominican was charged with um, being. And this was the first course that we, we completed. As Amanda said, our team consisted of uh, four faculty members, content contributors, and we also had a librarian, and we had two reviewers. Um, now, I think our team is actually very representative of the overall effort of the um, Ohio Open Ed Collaborative um, insofar as we had members representing um, the entire spectrum of the, um, of the college experience. We had um, faculty members from a community college, uh, from a small private institution, Ohio Dominican, uh, from Ohio State. Um, and uh, we also had a pretty wide representation of disciplines in the single course. Um, even though linear algebra is a mathematics course, we had um, a content contributor with background in economics and a content contributor with background in computer science and software engineering. 
And I think um, this uh, collaboration has really shaped um, the final product, the fact that there was so much diversity on the team and we all brought our experiences to, um, to make this final product. So let me start with the, um, uh, with the librarian because uh, that was kind of our starting point is to look and see what's out there and what we can do with it. Um, looking at um, open educational resources in mathematics, there's actually a lot of stuff available out there already. But those resources tend to be very traditional. This is a textbook that's been produced maybe for a number of years and then made into an open source and shared through OpenStax um, or a similar website. One thing that really surprised me personally is that our librarian was able to find all kinds of resources that are available to everybody through Ohio Link. And those are free resources um, available to institutions across the state, so all of the members of Ohio Link have access to them for free. And that is something we never really considered before. And so um, maybe as a side note, if anybody is considering um, doing um, an open source textbook and just can't find a textbook that's truly open, um, talk to your librarian. Uh, because there could be something right in the library that's available to everybody for free, even though it's not technically an open resource. So that was our starting point. Um, the other thing that we had to look at were the Ohio Transfer Agreement Guidelines. That was the foundation for pretty much all the courses that came out of this, um, of this project. And we had to make sure that um, whatever we make ultimately um, fits with those guidelines so the course is, uh, can be used across the state of Ohio. Now, as we surveyed the landscape of those open educational resources, um, we liked what we saw, but we also wanted to um, do something kind of different and maybe exciting, uh, something that would, um, that the modern student would appreciate, something more contemporary, something a little bit more interactive. And so um, that had a lot to do with uh, what we ultimately produced. Um, one of our reviewers, um, was uh, from The Ohio State University, and uh, through him, uh, we came in contact with the Chimera platform. Um, I don't know, many of you, I think, are actually familiar with the Chimera platform. Um, and we were able to use the platform to put our product out there in a way that I, I think is uh, very engaging uh, for the student. Now, um, Amanda mentioned that working with reviewers was a little different for this, for this project than um, it normally would be uh, because it was not a blind uh, peer review process. The reviewers were not there to say yay or nay um, and say, nope, this is just not good. We're not going to go through with this. Um, they were there to really um, help us along, uh, make suggestions, guide the project, maybe in a slightly different direction. Uh, but they became a part of the team and we really valued their time and expertise that they put, put into this with us. Um, so what did we ultimately produce? If you look up here, this is, um, yeah, this is actually a snapshot of um, uh, the Ohio um, OER Commons. Um, th this is a website hosted by Ohio Link, is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so all of the courses, um, to some extent, live on, um, on this website. And you can see the table of contents, and uh, um, there is a common landing page for the grant, and uh, you will be able to find eventually all of the courses um, on this website. Uh, but the actual product does not really live here. The actual product is on Chimera, so I will advance the slide. There we go. Just to give you an idea of what we ended up doing um, ultimately. So on the left-hand side, um, it shows you a table of contents as you would see it in Chimera. Um, we ended up producing over 50 modules um, of content, so they kind of resemble a textbook, but they're not really a textbook because of all the interactive features. And on the right-hand side, there are some screenshots of um, what a student might encounter as they read the text. So for example, on the bottom in the middle there, you see um, machine-graded exercises. Those are um, integrated throughout the text, so as the student is doing the reading, they're prompted to answer questions, enter the answers into boxes, and they're graded instantly, and uh, the students are given feedback. Um, so the answers that they can type in are, could be numerical, they could be um, responding to multiple choice questions, and things like that. 
Now, the other interactive features you see on the very right, um, up at the top, there is something called a Sage cell, which is essentially a programming cell that allows students to do some more heavy-duty computing and also to display some of their results graphically as they press that Evaluate button. And on the bottom, over here, um, you see a screenshot of um, another interactive feature, and that is um, GeoGebra. Um, so this is an, an open resource um, that you can go to online, and uh, what you can do is you can embed it directly into the Chimera um, textbook, and the student gets an opportunity to do an animation and uh, just play around with the, with the timer and uh, explore some of the concepts in a more interactive way. So this is uh, what our final product ended up looking like, and we also recommended a couple of um, open, um, open access textbooks um, in addition to this, just so that the instructor has a choice of maybe not using all of this, but using parts of this together with another textbook, so that there is a lot more freedom to, and a lot more opportunities to make correct um, choices that work in their own classrooms. This is impressive. I'm wondering how long it took them to create Chimera. Oh, Chimera, uh, several years, and they're still working on it. Yeah, that's fantastic. So are they getting feedback from your students who are using the OER? The course is being piloted right now. In fact, my co-authors, one of them, uh, is piloting it right now. Thank you, Paul. Um, so I don't want to speak for him. I think it's going OK. OK, <laughs> sounds good. Thank you so much. Um, I saw that there are ratings available for feedback on the open resources on the Ohio Open Ed Collaborative website. Is there an effort to track usage, and can you see which subjects and topics are being accessed or downloaded the most? Which are some of the more popular ones? Okay, so these, there's a couple different answers to these questions, and I guess the, the, most, the simplest way is to say you will be able to, but we're not quite there yet. So our site, um, just so you can go find it, uh, where all of these courses will be located is ohiolink.oercommons.org. And then from there, you can drill down to the Ohio Open Ed Collaborative Hub, which you'll want to search for that because that's the only place with content right now. Um, the idea of this site, it's an OER Commons microsite. So some of you that have used OER Commons in the past, it's a large repository of open materials. And we've branded an Ohio link uh, smaller version of that site where we're going to have um, open content from Ohio Link institutions, faculty members from Ohio Link institutions throughout the state. The only materials we have in there right now are related to this grant. But the idea is that eventually um, we'll be able to have other materials in there as well and maybe create hubs for other grant projects or other things that are going on in the state. As for ratings, this is sort of uh, something that we're trying to decide as a committee and at Ohio Link as well. There are ways that you can kind of do like an Amazon rating, like four stars, five stars. Um, but it's tricky because there are certain ways that we want, like we want to ensure that the people that are rating those materials um, are a faculty member in that discipline or someone that would be able to make that um, rating valuable for someone who sees it. Um, so whether that's, you know, you have to leave a comment with uh, you know, what institution you're from or something like that. We're still trying to work that process out. There are also some kind of embedded evaluation rubrics in the OER Commons site itself uh, that are kind of out of the box that we can use, but they're really long and lengthy, and I'm not sure how many people would take the time to fill out that entire rubric. So I guess the short answer is we are trying to come up with some kind of rating system that will be valuable for people. Um, but we also want to make sure that we're really careful about how we're doing that so that people's work is being fairly um, evaluated and represented for students. The other thing about tracking usage is um, right now I'm working with OER Commons to set up a system for doing this. Um, we've got kind of a Google Analytics um, package of reports that I get each week and we we are able to see which courses are clicked on the most. At this point, though, it's sort of um, 
the data isn't really accurate because the courses that are clicked on the most are the ones where they're still populating the data. So I'm getting like, <laughs> Calculus 1 is blowing up because they're actually putting their materials in right now. So I think that that data will become more accurate and we'll be able to get a picture of it uh, once the courses are all there and we can look at kind of a long-term uh, view of clicks on those materials. And the other thing that I think is interesting, the um, data that we're getting is time on page. So instead of, you know, it's, it's easy to look and see, oh, this, you know, this one got clicked on 800 times, but when the average click on those pages is, you know, two to three minutes, I think that means people are actually really looking at the material and, and trying to sift through it and see if it would be useful for their class. So we're trying to make efforts right now to really push out um, information about these courses for the first seven that have been completed. So that was that list in the beginning. Uh, and so we're doing things like marketing to department chairs uh, at institutions throughout the state. We've sent flyers through, to all the Ohio Link deans and directors to put in books to say, hey, are you teaching this course? These materials are available. So the idea is that people could take these materials in whatever way would be useful to them, whether that's partially to replace something that you know, they're using right now or to fill in a gap or to reduce the cost somehow um, or to reduce the cost entirely. But we want people to really be able to use this in a way that matches their course and their expertise and how it would work best for them. So. Thank you. Uh -huh. I feel like you're doing the work for us. <laughs> well, hopefully. <laughs> By okay. reaching out to the deans. Yeah, that helps. Um, I always try to reach out to faculty when I can, when I meet with them. Um, do you think there will be continued creation and curation beyond the grant funding period? Will there be an opportunity for other academics who weren't part of the grants to contribute to the subject areas on a voluntary basis? If so, how would they go about gaining access to contribute to the content? So this is also in process too. Like I mentioned, we want this site to be available to all Ohio Link faculty um, that have created open content and want to put it in there. Um, there will be a way that you can become a member of the site and if you're a member of the site you can contribute. But what I'm doing right now is really trying to focus on projects that I know are already in existence. So for example, we're working with the Ohio Open Ed Collaborative and all of those materials will be there. I've also been working with um, Columbus State who's got a, a a grant program going with their faculty and we're trying to come up with ways that they might be able to include their materials in our site as well. Um, I know there are other institutions throughout the state that are doing grants with faculty to create material and I'm trying to look for ways to kind of target programs that are already already up and running um, before I kind of put out the call to, hey, anyone can come and put something in. I'd really like to populate it with materials that um, have, have been vetted and the easiest way to do that is for me to work with programs that are having those materials vetted on their campus. Um, because I am not a subject matter expert in all of these subjects, unfortunately. So um, that's kind of the, the plan right now. But I'm open to, you know, if anybody wants to talk with me about ideas they have about putting their materials in or if you know of an existing pool of Ohio resources that would be great to add, please reach out and contact me because I would love to get them in there. The, the wider the base of resources, the more people will come and use it, and that's the goal, so. Awesome. Um, some grant funding entities have put an emphasis on awarding funding to high enrollment courses in order to maximize savings to students. Can you talk about efforts to support development of OER for not so high enrollment courses going on now or in the future? What are your criteria for funding projects large and small? Maybe Ashley could talk about that. Um, this slide uh, is actually just a picture of the ALX homepage. ALX is the program at OSU uh, that helps, among other things, we help um, faculty adopt and create open educational resources through grants. Um, Affordablelearning.osu.edu if you want to learn more. But um, so we uh, actually don't focus on high enrollment courses at Ohio State. Um, we love when people who teach high enrollment courses want to apply for a grant and want to adopt open educational resources, but um, those courses aren't our bread and butter because they are um, 
th those are very, very large classes that impact lots and lots of students. A lot of decisions are made by committee and a lot of, um, there's a lot of complexity in that decision making process. So um, this is also part of why we don't focus on the one textbook being the answer. So it's not, never a one to one um, answer to the question of how can I save my students money. Uh, in those types of courses, sometimes uh, the, the kinds of projects we see are, um, you know, perhaps there's more than one book required or there's um, um, a lab manual or, or some other materials that can be, that can be open um, or that faculty can create themselves. Uh, but there tends to be a, a mixture of solutions that, that goes on um, that include not open resources in a lot of those courses. So uh, we have so far um, funded 70 projects. I don't have like a percentage breakdown of which of those were large GE courses and which weren't. Um, but we have funded projects for um, really large courses, well, high enrollment, so like 1,500 to 1,700 students per year, lectures with um, 750 students in one room, um, all the way down to a course that's taught once a year with 24 students, um, and, you know, maybe an upper level or graduate course. So everything in between that spectrum we funded. So um, all of our campuses have participated in our grants program as well. And so we have different um, course sizes and types of um, courses represented there as well. So one of the things that we're gonna do at Ohio State is just um, as we start to move out of the content development phase of this project and start moving into the um, adoption phase um, is just sort of um, take this product as just another product that we can um, talk to our faculty about and help them as they make choices about affordable content. Um, and so we, we hope to have more high enrollment um, courses because that's, th that's the audience for, for these courses. But um, yeah, there's room for everyone. That's fantastic. I know a lot of history of art and art professors that like to make OER, so I like to see support for them. Mm -hmm. um, Anna Bindok, uh, what information was collected for review and reporting purposes for the grant? Oh. So I actually am not part of the evaluation team, but I reached out to the evaluation team to um, get uh, kind of a higher level description of the evaluation um, for you all so that you could see. But um, like I said, I'm not the expert and their names are at the end. So if you have any specific questions that you want to reach out and ask them, um, please do so. But there's a team from Ohio State who is running the evaluation piece of our Ohio Open Ed Collaborative grant. And they're, I'm going to have to stand up because I can't see from here. <laughs> here, come here. Come here. Thank you. Okay, I want to make sure I'm accurately representing them because this is not my work. Um, so their goals were to understand what it's like to participate on a statewide institutional content team. So I think this is different for a lot. This is one of the things that I keep hearing is that it's different for faculty to be part of a team that has multiple institutions on it for a grant. So I think that's a new experience and they wanted to evaluate that experience for faculty to identify opportunities and barriers to the adoption of these materials. So we know that this will not be the answer for everyone and we want to know what some of those reasons are, so what some of the reasons that it is a good choice for some and what are some of the reasons that it wasn't a good choice for others. And then exploring the perspective of students who have been in classes where the materials were adopted. So um, each of the institutions who are participating in the evaluation have to provide kind of this basic information gathering. So uh, courses that are taught, um, how many students were enrolled, textbook costs, that kind of thing. So we can do kind of that basic, you know, these, uh, these are the number of students who were um, affected by these new materials. And then I think they also have to submit, I'm not sure if it's up there or not, but the cost of their materials prior to using these new materials. 
And then this, these are the data collection methods. So I like this, this is like cogs here working together. So they have student focus groups. Well, actually I should start over here because this is what they're doing right now. Instructor interviews in spring of 2019 as well as content team participant interviews. So the content team participant interviews are people who are actually working on these faculty teams that are working with Amanda and Ashley. Um, and then the instructor interviews, they could be, um, I, actually I think, let me read this. Oh, I don't have it in front of me. So the instructors are not necessarily on the content teams. They're just people who have adopted the materials or they could be non-adopter instructors as well. So they're really looking at people who have evaluated the materials and decided whether to adopt or not. And then in the fall, they will follow up with students um, and do focus group with students who uh, were part of courses where the materials were used. And this is the team here. Um, Dr. Shauna Jaggers, uh, Dr. Amanda Folk, and Marcos Rivera. So if you want contact information for any of those folks, um, feel free to ask us and I can get you in touch with them. But they have really um, been working hard on putting this evaluation plan together and we're excited to, to see what comes out of it. I just want to say thank you all for participating. I'm out of time. I'd love if we could get uh, questions, but um, we have to move on to keep on track. Um, really? Okay. Amanda's, Amanda's saying it's okay to take one or two questions. Would the audience have any questions? Yeah. Hang on one moment, one moment. Who funded the grant? And, and the content lives at Ohio State, right? No. It's the Ohio Department of Higher Education is where the grant money actually came from. But the website where it's being housed is through our partnership with Ohio Link. So Ohio, like no, that's kind of the gray area right now. The, the content, all the content that's being produced is openly licensed and it's being put in an open repository. Um, so it doesn't live anywhere in any, any one place other than um, the um, OER Commons. And, and that website, the, who, who manages that platform? Ohio Link does. So it's ohiolink.oercommons.org. And is there, is there a template that you set up or someone? Uh, um, I actually have it in my slides from my pre-conference presentation, which I'll share with all of you. Okay, We'll great. put it in our public comments for the conference. Hi there. I'm working on the Intro to Ethics group for this cohort. And I'm, my only question with it is, where did the transfer assurance guidelines come from? Like, those are really directing ultimately the project. So I was, I was always sort of curious, like, who wrote those and... Anyway, that's a that's there are committees. Um, yeah. So from the uh, faculty. Across yeah, the, the state. Ohio Department of Higher Education has a transfer and assurance department, and they have faculty teams that create those guidelines. And I think they're reviewed every three years, mm -hmm. um, depending on the course. But yeah, it's a team of faculty from Ohio institutions that come up with them. <laughs> so the question was: Is there any plan for updating? Once we've, the three, because two are running, right? And there'll, there'll be a third at the end mm -hmm. of this year. What, what, is there any like timeline projected for updating that content? We have a sustainability plan that we're working on. Um, we have some funds that we're go gonna be able to use to encourage, um, to help encourage um, individual faculty across the state to con continue to contribute. But ultimately this is where um, the um, open nature of the work is kind of key to its longevity. Um, like I said, everything's openly licensed. <clears throat> it lives out in the world and it's made better by the community. And um, it, it gets updated when it gets updated ultimately. I mean, I think, I think this is a problem, right? This is, this is an established issue with, with open content. We do have a sustainability plan that extends as far as we can to um, kind of add structure to that. But ultimately, um, no one owns the content. It, it, we have a place where it lives. 
when we have original authors, but then you know through remix and through um, sharing and through organic growth, those things take on a life of their own, um, depending on the context in which they're adopted. Okay, okay uh, we have to move on now, but thank you so much. Thank you for your thank participation. You. <laughs> Should I just start? Do you want to wait a minute? Wait a minute? Oh. Oh, yeah. I didn't see that. It's amazing in here. Okay. I think we're... And you're going to do the... the yes, the numbers. Or, or Mandy will. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much for that. Excellent discussion. Oh, I have to get closer, okay. So my name is Barbara Loomis, and I'm the Digital Scholarly Publications and Programs Administrators at CSU Library. It is my privilege to introduce two innovators of open educational resources. Now, <laughs> Melanie Gagich is an associate college lecturer in the first year writing program at CSU, and Emily Zickel is an assistant college le lecturer in the same department. Not only are they early adopters and creators of OERs, but they also led a team of first year writing faculty to create an open access rhetoric textbook currently used in all first year writing courses at CSU. Please help me welcome Melanie Gagich and Emily Zickel. Hello. So, as uh, Barbara said, I'm Melanie Gagich, and Emily and I are going to be talking today about integrating the open access textbook into our first year writing classrooms. However, we would like to start with a clicker. How do I click? <laughs> okay. We would like to start uh, by having you imagine that you are a group of freshmen on your first day of class in our English 100 uh, classroom. So, it's syllabus day. And what we'd like you to do is we'd like you to take out your phone or your laptop and find our textbook. So please Google a guide to rhetoric, genre, and success in first year writing. When you've found it, hold up your phone or hold up your hand to let us know that you found our textbook. <laughs> nice. Bonus points for you. <laughs> First people get bonus points. All right, yeah, all right, enthusiasm, I like it. Warm yourselves up, yes, all right. Okay, fantastic students, that's great. So everybody found it. Uh, if you have any questions, please let us know and one, one of us will come around and help you. Now, we'd really like you to be able to navigate your uh, textbook a little bit. So if you would please find chapter 1.2 and either with a partner or by yourself, please figure out how many absences you're allowed in our three day a week class. And then in chapter 1.3, please tell us where you can find the Michael Schwartz Library. We'll give you a minute to do this. <laughs> yeah? All right. There's no book. <laughs> Share your answer with a friend. Yeah, share your answer with a friend. It's important to make connections with your classmates. Yeah. You're going to be together for the next 16 weeks. Okay. There's no clock. Clock's right here. Oh, okay. Oh, wait. All right. All right. So, can anybody, do we have a volunteer to tell us how many absences you can have? Yes, over there. Four. You're allowed to have four absences without any penalties. And can somebody else tell us where the Michael Schwartz Library is located? Yes. First floor of Rhodes Tower, yes. 
Okay, so your student role is done. Thank you all for participating. <laughs> but basically, we wanted to give you an opportunity to sort of see what it's like to start a semester off with an open access textbook. Uh, we think it's especially important whenever you have freshman students who are very nervous about things like, do I have to raise my hand to go to the bathroom? Where do I find a textbook? What is a textbook? So a lot of students have these issues on the first day of class. And sort of having this opportunity to have them uh, interact with it on the first day of class means that they literally walk out of the room that day with the textbook in their hands. So as we know, textbooks are expensive, and free textbooks are awesome. But if students don't know how to access it, that can be problematic. Secondly, on the first day of class, students have already navigated that textbook, and it allows us instructors, so if people had been having issues, we could have walked up to them and helped them, which gives us a one-on-one -on -one communication with those students on day one, and it sort of opens up a conversation about how do you navigate this, why are we using this, what questions do you have? So again, that's one of the reasons why we wanted to start with a sort of like role-playing game, if you will. And it leads us into some of the other content that we have that Emily is going to talk about, which is some of the textbook integration strategies that we've used, that we think a lot of these can also be used in smaller classes or larger classes, not necessarily just first-year writing classrooms. Um, so with the first day activity that you guys just did, that was something that I think was interesting to us in using an open source text the way that we do in first year writing and probably in any class, but mostly in first year writing, that it changes the way that we interact with our students really from day one, most of the time on the first day of college, the first class of the first semester. Students don't walk into class with a textbook, and they do when they have it on their phones. Um, yes, there are sometimes some access issues. No, not all of our students have phones, but pretty much most of our students have either a phone or a laptop, or then we can open the door to discuss on day one. If you don't have a laptop, here's where at CSU you can go and rent a laptop if you need one. So that's to say that um, traditional first day assignments. How many of you guys are instructors, faculty members? How many of you do icebreakers on the first day of class? <laughs> I mean, we, there's a way that I think a lot of times instructors do first day activities. This is a profoundly different way of doing the first day activity. And I think it is really empowering when maybe the icebreakers aren't empowering or exciting, but we teach differently. And, and on day one, we get to teach differently because of this textbook. And so now what we want to share after um, what is almost a full year of using this at CSU are some examples of how this particular text has um, sh reshaped to some degree, small or large, um, or just fundamentally changed some of the ways that we are able to teach our class because we know that our students have the book literally in their hand all the time, even though sometimes they forget that. Um, all right. So we'll talk about examples of prep activities, um, activities that we do with students as they are in the midst of getting papers ready, which is papers and, and other um, composition projects. That's what we're focusing on in English 100 and 101 and 102. Um, giving feedback, we spend a lot of our lives providing feedback both on drafts and on final versions. And then the last thing is um, how we have used this book, this particular book that we employ in our classrooms for feedbacking on final projects. Can you get, it looks very faint from where I'm standing, so hopefully you can see that clearly. Um, quizzing, quizzing is not the most exciting thing that anyone has ever figured out how to do in a classroom. The nice thing about using um, the textbook <laughs> um, in this way is that uh, when we provide quizzes, and this is an example of a Blackboard quiz. And this is actually one of mine, and it was while I was being lazy, because really what I can and should have done was hyperlink to those chapters. But sometimes I feel like I can ask the students to do that themselves, navigate to the book. Um, but providing the quiz isn't just about, hey, come up with the information. Hey, give me the, the content that I want you to know. It's a lot more about creating a behavior of getting students to realize at the beginning of a unit that the information that you need is in the book. Um, and I, we've heard a little bit from students. I've heard a little bit from students. Sometimes this works to just establish the connection. Hey, I know in this unit I'm going to need this content. 
we've started off with a quiz, so I know where to get the content, I know where I need to go back and double check for things. It doesn't always work that way, but we're, we're working on that, right? This is Melanie's activity, so I'm gonna let you talk about it. Uh, my activity is pretty basic, but instead of in-class activities that ask students to sort of just summarize their book chapter or talk about it, I direct them specifically to sections that correlate with the activity that we're doing in class or with the paper that you're, they're creating. So this is an example of me using integrating Google Docs with the uh, online textbook and asking students to think about what they're reading and translate it into connections for their upcoming assignment. So again, not just being like, hey, what is the second word on the second page, but how can you transfer this knowledge that's being discussed in 9.2 and transfer it into your writing assignment and transfer it into perhaps even other classes, Woo, which would be amazing. <laughs> Thank you. And because it's on Google Docs, it is hyperlinked, um, which Again, and I think we've had conversations about is that too much when you're constantly providing the hyperlinks to students, but then also saying, hey, you need to go and find this resource. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't, but we're providing various opportunities for students to engage with the textbook, which we could not do at CSU when we used our traditional textbook. It was a hard copy book, and students that either <laughs> either owned it or didn't, and most often they didn't. Um, Another thing that we can do with these textbooks, and it is something that I did not do before we had this book, was ask students to um, talk about how they're using it. And, and maybe just the fact that we adopted this text and we were worried about how students would use it, or, or we had this heightened sense of wanting to know how students were engaging with the text, um, encouraged this idea of asking students to reflect on the way that they are learning. But it has been really interesting. And this is an incentivized assignment. Students hand this in in my class with every single paper that they write. I want to know how they've planned. I want to know what resources they've used. The book is one resource of many, um, but they are required to tell me what things helped them as they um, moved along the writing process. The, fir the first time they do this, it's usually um, weak. They'll say things like, I used the book. It was great. It was super helpful. Um, and then with some encouragement and discussion in class, um, I asked them to dig a little bit deeper. S students do have a hard time figuring out how to use even a textbook to get the information they need. And, and that spills into problems with research in later courses. Um, so we can start in English 100 or 101 at, at this school, which is not a research-based class, asking students to engage in research behaviors to accomplish the tasks they need to accomplish in non-research assignments, um, just by incentivizing their um, sort of detailed look at the resources that they have in order to complete assignments. We use Blackboard here at CSU, and one of the features of Blackboard that Melanie and I both use is the Turnitin um, for either draft feedbacking or final version grading. And one of the lovely things about using uh, Turnitin is that an instructor can embed and create his or her own comments. Um, you'll see here the, the works cited errors as a comment that I wrote and then it says click for explanation student Please, please learn more about what's going on and then within that comment There is a direct link back to the textbook where they can get some information several actually several different pieces of information um, This can feel overwhelming to students to, to get a lot of information and feedback But that's a labor issue for a lot of instructors. How do we provide? thorough, detailed information to our students on the work that they're doing without killing ourselves, because it takes a long time. Um, so with this interaction between uh, Turnitin, or among Turnitin and Blackboard and the open text source, hyperlinking it in there, I, I believe that we are able to give a lot of information to our students. I use this significantly in my online section of English 102, and the students um, are thankful that they get a lot of information but then they also can ignore it if they want to, and I don't feel guilty. Um, that's, and it, it should be a student's choice if they want to engage with it or not, and, and being able to hyperlink is a big part of that. Um, finally, and this is very similar to the draft design with a um, final draft that is submitted, a student gets one final chance to really reflect on and articulate how he or she might have used some of the resources from the book 
and from many others. And there, our students are remarking that there are particular chapters that help them. Maybe it's not always the chapter that we would suggest. <laughs> Um, but again, I think that's part of a student's own learning process is identifying um, what is useful to them, how it is useful to them, and that leads to longer term usage of these open source texts. And I know Melanie has had, had several comments from students that well beyond English 101 and 102 students are going back to the book. It is a source that they trust. It is where they want to go to get information that they need even for other classes. And then finally, I don't know if you can see that because I can't really. Oh, no, they're not hyperlinked because, Sam, I don't know if I can hyperlink in the, in the rubric. Um, but there's one last chance to really say to students, hey, you, you need resources in order to complete this work and do it well. Um, again, using Blackboard, if an instructor is grading papers online, um, there is an opportunity to not just say um, you need to refer to the author better but to say you need to refer to the author better and it is in this particular chapter in the book where you can go and find more information. Um, this would be in a, a total assessment. This isn't a work in progress. This is the student has done it or not and as an instructor we are assessing the quality of their work but also providing an opportunity for them to go and find more information, more resources on how to do it better next time. Also, sort of to piggyback on what Emily is saying about the integration of these activities, um, I think a lot of them would still work with traditional commercially published textbooks. However, I think that a lot of these are also really embracing the affordances of a digital textbook that's also free. So students can use all of these hyperlinks. They can also hyperlink themselves. So I mean, there's a lot of opportunities for students to create their own learning guides. Um, whenever we're talking about uh, quiz banks, right? I mean, Emily has a bunch of quizzes that she's created that if she shares them, <clears throat> Okay, she does share them. Uh, so then other people can access them. Um, other people who can create these different supplements are really embracing the idea of open educational resources, not just the open access textbook, which I think is really important. And it's still embracing, you know, the 21st century digital literacy practices where students have this access to their phone, to their laptop in class, and it's a way to sort of navigate that. Uh, which also leads into my other slide here, which is challenges of using these OA textbooks in the classroom the way that we're describing. So one of the things that um, still surprises us is students still, what are we, we're in week eight right now, and some students still have issues finding the textbook. So we tell them about the favorites tab, we tell them to take a picture of it on their phone, we tell them to Google it, we have it on Blackboard, I have it on my Google Docs, we have it in lots of places, and yet still students sometimes struggle to remember what it is that we're asking them to find. So I don't know how to solve that problem, but it's something that we have to consider uh, continuing on with this project. Another one is reading the textbook in class. I mean, this comes back to you ask a student to get their phone out and they are probably gonna be tempted to look at Instagram or Snapchat or Reddit or whatever it is that they're doing. And so they become distracted by the technology. One of the ways that I sort of counteract this is to just kind of go with it and we talk about sort of appropriate professional behavior. If you have a text message and it's a yes or no text message, then answer that text message and put it down and keep reading your textbook. If, however, it's a long, dramatic, intense situation, then maybe save that for later. Um, so it's, again, one of those things that we talk about in class and I try to model that behavior as well. And then lastly, navigating the textbook can be a little tricky sometimes because Pressbooks makes updates without notifying people, uh, which is always fun, <laughs> especially when it happens right before the semester is about ready to start. So there's that. So navigating for the instructors. And then students may still lack functional technology skills. So if you look at it on your phone, it looks different than when you look at it on your computer. And when you look at it on your phone, you have to know to hit the menu button, those three things in the right-hand corner. And students still struggle with things like that. So again, as we continue doing this, this is the only the end of the second first year, I'm sorry. Uh, it's just stuff that we can sort of start thinking about in terms of how to deal with it. Uh, one of the last things that I have to talk about as well is in the fall, I wanted to survey and find out some student perceptions because all of our students in the first year writing program were uh, required to use this book. So everybody had access to it. I sent out a survey and 225 students responded, which isn't a too bad of a response rate. And basically 86% perceive it as accessible, 84% think it's easy to use, 77% think that the content is relevant, and 77% find it effective. 
This really reflects the research that's already been done in OER and open access, but it's really nice to see it reflected in our institution with our textbook. And of course, one of the things that I should probably do eventually is ask students to define what they mean by accessible, easy to use, and relevant. But for now, we'll assume that they know what that means <laughs> and that this is again reflecting the current research, which is a good thing, I would say. So, what we're going to do now is going to warm you up, hopefully, a little bit. And we're going to ask you to participate in an activity for 15 minutes. Um, so we'd like you to get with a partner and then respond to at least one of the three scenarios. So either the one that says, I want to integrate an OA textbook, but I don't know how to use it in class. Uh, what would suggestions do you have? What would you say to an instructor who is worried about letting students use technology in a classroom? Uh, what possible solutions are there? And then students are having trouble finding and navigating their OA textbook. What, what suggestions do you have? So whether you're an instructor or a librarian or any other position, <laughs> I think there's something for everyone here. So anything to add? All right, so take, like I said, maybe 10 minutes and then we'll come back together and talk a little bit. Arlo would be getting ready to party. <laughs> Should we mingle? Wait, I need to take my, I don't remember what our activities are. Okay, you wanna take mine? No, because it's right there. Oh, on the big board. Does that work? If somebody wants to share? Or do you just wanna ask questions? We've got 10 minutes. Okay. All right, everybody. It's nice to hear. It's nice to hear your chatty voices. We don't even have to play an icebreaker to get you guys to talk to each other. <laughs> um, did anybody look at the first question? I want to integrate an OA textbook, but I don't know how to use it in class. What suggestions do you have for this eager yet confused instructor? <laughs> Anyone? Not all at once. Over here. Over here. No, I was just going to say we talked about an example where I use mine uh, for, I use uh, like end of chapter discussion questions, you know, just to generate small group and then large group discussion. And also I try to use some of the short cases in the book um, for discussion or for little activities. And, and I also use the book for various homework, small homework assignments. So I'm trying to push them there beyond just the weekly reading. So those are some things that, that we do already. So a mix of using it in class and out of class, right? Which is nice when you have to use it in class and people can actually access it instead of I forgot my book at home. I can't do anything. <laughs> How about the second question? What would you say to an instructor who's worried about letting students use technology in class? Because <gasps> they're just all gonna watch Netflix. That's all they ever do. <laughs> Anyone? They really do sometimes. Though. I know they do. <laughs> but not if you're an engaging enough instructor, Melanie. If your content's on fire. <laughs> or if you're a mean instructor and you say, stop watching Netflix, like until you're doing it. Knock it off. Yeah. Yes. Oh, okay. Um, I'll, I'll be honest. I have not had this be a big problem. Um, I do a lot of teaching with online material, and so what I tell them is, if you're looking at the online material or you're looking at something related to it, that's fine. If I walk around and see that everybody is reading manga, then we'll have to revisit this conversation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think that, I honestly think that the sort of realistic approach like that makes a lot of sense. I've had a lot of success with that. I I think. I mean, unless they're hiding it really well, which may be happening. But I do think that having conversations about what, what are you looking at, do you really want to continue this type of behavior, or do you want me to switch back to the other way of teaching without those online materials? So I appreciate that approach. That's also, that's also talking to your students about learning. 
And, and I think for whatever reason, and maybe it's just because we have total ownership over this text, but it f opens the doors for lots of conversations with students about learning. And, and I think that that's really empowering to me as an instructor. And I think it's different for students too. Instead of just saying, read this chapter, we do have to take extra time to talk about how to get the chapter sometimes. Um, and then we can bring it up in class and we can all look at it in class. And we can also have conversations about what it means to be productive in the 50 minutes or the hour and 15 minutes that we are together and what choice do you wanna make as a learner? Do you wanna make this worth your time or would you rather do this later or do it again and be super bored? And students do tend to respond to that, I think. And then the last one, does anybody want to tell us if students are having trouble finding and navigating their OA textbook? Yes. Uh, so um, we, we, we talked a lot about this, um, and I think it's, it, you just hit on this as well, um, and the answer to all the questions is the same. And it's, um, like without being too, um, you know, dismissive, I guess. Um, the, the answer is for the instructor to um, maybe increase their digital literacy, <laughs> um, you make better use of the LMS, think of creative solutions for um, delivering the content that they have been solved for them perhaps in the past by the conventional textbook. Um, and so one of the things that um, that we talked about was if you if you take uh, maybe that 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 huge PDF, maybe you break it up into chapters and you and you put it into your LMS um, on you know it, 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 this is a this is all about course design with um, modern course <laughs> modern learning materials and um, lessening dependence on a, a prescribed. Um, way of doing things that you, that you would get in a textbook. So it's like a, um, like I, I, know, I know that it could come across as dismissive, <laughs> but the suggestion is for all of these, you know, you have to deal with it. Like you have to talk to them about using technology in class. Mm -hmm. You're not teaching them about English. You're teaching them about how to be a grown up person. Mm -hmm. um, you have to figure out how to, you know, if they can't, if they can't find the textbook, like what are they, what's their real problem? What are they really asking you? <laughs> so it's about teaching and unfortunately, we aren't necessarily great teachers because we're experts in, you know, um, 17th century Irish literature or whatever you guys wrote your dissertations about, you know, so, <laughs> but, <laughs> you know, so that's the, that's, the, that's the thing. Anyway, that's my philosophical yeah, answer. I do, I, I appreciate that answer as well, and I think it's a really good point. However, I still, so I am actually working on my dissertation, <laughs> and my dissertation is exploring students' emotional responses to digital assignments, and there's still a lot of pushback where students see digital work as home stuff, stuff that they do outside of school, and stuff that they do inside of school should be traditional prescribed stuff, otherwise it's not learning. And I do think that it is part of our onus to sort of teach them how to think differently about that. And sometimes it requires getting instructors to think differently about that too, um, for better or for worse, but I think it's a really good idea, yeah. Uh, does anybody have, we have three minutes. Does anybody have any questions for us? I know we covered it all. <laughs> yeah. Did you get support for writing that book? Yeah. Like, lots, lots of lots of money. I mean, how did you? <laughs> lots of money. <laughs> I mean, did you got institutional support to write the book? I'm just thinking. I mean, one of the common things I keep thinking while we're here um, is that there seems to be so many resources floating around that are not available to us at our small institution of Ursuline College. Like, you know, so when we set out to write our books and stuff, it's sort of, you know, with a 4-4 teaching load and a 5 committee load and an adv advising load. So I'm just curious, like, where the support comes from. I'll go first. <laughs> yeah. The library supported us first and continuously. So they work with us a lot. We got a small grant 
uh, Emily and I both created our own textbook first and then we combined our textbooks to create the current textbook. And a lot of that content was first taken from our own stuff that we already had written. And then we also took it from other OERs and you know, did the redapt and revise. And then because that was successful, we were then able to get support from the provost's office. And so we were paid um, a little bit from the provost's office to work with a team of six part-time instructors who then wrote even more original content and helped her and I revise and edit and re-adapt, re adapt, sorry, <laughs> one of the R's. And uh, <laughs> that was sort of the way that we've done it. But I mean, we've been supported by the library the whole way. Like, we are champions of the library for sure. So thanks, guys. <laughs> yeah. But, and I mean, that is something to consider. We also teach a 4-4 load. I'm also writing my dissertation and we have a lot of committee work. So it was just something that we really wanted to do too. Not saying that you don't, but I mean, it's just, it's tough, I think. It's also something that I think we, we'd already been doing and then the grant, like Melanie had written her own stuff because the textbooks were frustrating and I'd been using stuff from um, writing spaces and writing commons, which are both open access sites and sort of was like, I don't know what these things are, but they're really good and I can use them because I'm allowed to use them. Um, so part of it was I think we were already primed and then this came along and then the library had 500 to $1,000 grants for instructors who were willing to work on this and implement it over a year, is that correct? What, what, okay. Um, and then that was successful enough that it caught the attention of the higher ups. All right, right on time. Thank you so much. <laughs>